I'm Aubrey Sitterson, and this is Scald. This is a chapter of my ongoing fantasy narrative. Like the Scalds of old, I've written it to be heard, not read. And there's no music, sound effects, or character actors. It's all me. I do it in one single flawless take. Scald picks up where we left off last time. So if you want the full story, you might need to go back to earlier episodes. But it's not mandatory. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald, part 15. Dylan's soul screamed and flailed inside of him, desperate to escape the torturous gaze the one true king of men. Maul knelt on the monk's chest, his murderous notched cudgel raised in the air on the precipice of a single fatal downward strike. And as it arced in the air, pausing ever so briefly, Zylan contemplated the truth, thought on what he knew and what he thought he knew and where they overlapped. But all he could see were flames the fires of creation that would burn all of existence until they flamed out, leaving only the abyss, that inky black void of nothingness. The flames, the flames, the flames. As the cudgel arced downward, Xylan shot out his hands, placing them upon Maul's temples. Suddenly, Maul's eyes, previously burning with the fire of faded cataclysm, they were now filled with a different flame. The dark, cold burn of inescapable logic, the truthful fire that burned from the inside out, igniting the angry brand upon Zylan's neck with every expenditure of his blasphemous power. Maul howled in pain and rage, in fury and agony, but as Zylan watched the savage fall back, clutching his temples, he heard Maul's screams meld with something else. Incongruously, they joined and amplified themselves with laughter. A cold, hateful, sardonic laugh, and though Maul's eyes held nothing but suffering, his mouth was pulled back and twisted, frozen in a rictus grin. Zylan leapt to his feet. His body would be covered in bruises the next day, but his first priority was making sure he lived to see the next day. Maul was inconsolable, if Maul was even still truly there, so Xylan prepared to do that which was always his last resort. He prepared to fight. As Maul climbed up from the abyss, taking to his feet, shoulders hunched, breathing heavily, Xylan loosened the sash that held his robes in place. A blow from Maul's cudgel, wielded in pure, hateful, aggrieved aggression, while possibly not enough to take Xylan's life, was more than enough to knock him off balance, opening him up for the now inevitable, fatal blow. Xylan would have to avoid being hit at all, so he billowed out his robes, making his sinewy frame hard to pinpoint, and began the shifting, rolling combat maneuvers of his former order. Maul lunged at Xylan's form, swinging his cudgel with every ounce of his pent-up rage and might. Though Maul's only training with formal combat came as a child when he learned the delicate swordplay of the High Elves, the true king of men was not without experience. If he could not pinpoint Xylan's precise position, he would unleash a horizontal swipe that would strike his body wherever it hid in those billowing robes. With nowhere to dodge and only limited room to retreat before he found his back to a mighty oak tree and the difficult brush that surrounded it, Xylan took the only route available to him, dropping low, crouching underneath Maul's attack, then rising up again to face the savage's now exposed flank. Xylan carried no weapon. Though he had forsaken much of his old order, there were some rules he still kept. But if the monk were to win this fight he knew that he must speak to Maul in a language that he understood. So he pulled back his arm and then presented his best argument. Xylan's open palm struck just underneath Maul's ribs, 
not far from where he had once laid hands upon the savage to heal him of the doomberry's effects. But now, instead of removing that twisting, anguished pain at the center of Maul's gut, instead of taking away his suffering, Xylem brought it back to him, magnified a dozen times over. Maul cried out wildly as his stomach tied itself in knots. Dylan knew that Maul wasn't alone inside his head. He could hear it in his screams, overrun with laughter, and he could see it in his eyes, devoid of sense, home only to ravenous fury. But he could also see something else. That whatever it was with him, that whatever hateful old deceiver Maul had given himself over to, that he was not one to suffer unnecessarily, and that the taste of the doomberries was not to his liking. Maul, focus, come back, you are not yourself. Maul, clutching his abdomen with one hand, swung his cudgel wildly with the other, an uncalculated backhanded strike. And who are you to presume to know who I am? I am a king. Dylan just barely managed to hop back out of the cudgel's range, then quickly dashed forward again, circling around in his shifting, rolling motions, keeping his back away from the trees. I would be your friend, if you would allow it. Did I not heal you when you suffered? Friend? Friend? The dying man is always eager to make friends, isn't he? Was it a friend who gave his agony back to me? Maul released his churning stomach and took his cudgel with both hands, then brought it crashing down toward Xylan. But the monk's billowing robe saved him, barely, as the cudgel hit nothing but tangles of silk, which Xylan quickly used to wrap up the club, holding it in place. Ah, Coward! Stand and fight! Enough of your dancing! Oh, I'll stand and fight. Xylan twisted using the full weight of his body to wrench the cudgel from Maul's fist, sending it flying back behind him. A fight. The odds evened out. Just a bit. As Xylan circled around Maul, looking for an opening, he saw where Maul's cudgel had landed. On the ground, next to Skog. And the giant cat, rendered unconscious by Farron Magics, began to raise her massive, dream-filled head. I could lose both arms, be set upon by snarling beasts, and still, still, you would be no match for me, monk. Are you that foolish to think otherwise? The fool is the one who attacks his friends as if they were enemies. With the wisps, Xylan had already seen that if the savage couldn't breathe, then he couldn't fight. So the monk gave his answer with another strike, stepping forward and jabbing his fingers directly at Maul's Adam's apple. But Maul, even in the throes of doomberry agony, was still too quick, turning to the side just enough that Xylan's fingers struck and were turned away by the corded muscle that lined the sides of Maul's thick neck. I've known friends like you. I've had more than I can stand of their arrogance and their lies. What was my friend doing with my horn? Xylan had overplayed his hand, had stepped in too close, thinking too much of his own martial abilities and too little of Maul's. He realized this as Maul's heavy, artless fist crashed into his jaw. But fortunately for Xylan, he had also stepped in too close for Maul's liking, as he was unable to deliver a full haymaker, instead landing only a jab. But though it was just a simple jab, it was still more than enough to send the monk staggering back, struggling to remain upon his feet. It was just looking. I had never seen such beauty. It called to me. Liar! Maul rushed at Xylan, putting aside the agony in his gut, aiming only to place him in the dirt where traitors belonged. And then, as the monk choked on the dust, then Maul would determine how best to take his life. 
but his maul charged and failed to notice that the angry brand on Xylan's neck had begun glowing once again. At the last possible second before impact, before Maul, a charging bull, would collide with his already wounded prey, at the last conceivable moment, Xylan did the unthinkable. He leapt toward his attacker. Xylan placed his hands upon Maul's chest. Not in an attack, but gently, a motion meant to calm the raging beast. The monk staring certain death in the eye, put forth what little energy he had left within him, then leaned in close and whispered into Maul's ear. Arnie, coming up. Maul's eyes went wide as he fell to the ground, and Xylan's eyes went wide as he saw that his gambit, his desperate last-ditch effort to save his skin, had worked. Maul, please, calm yourself. Xylan approached the savage slowly, cautiously, his hands outstretched to show that his intentions were pure. He breathed a sigh of relief as he saw that Maul's eyes, once filled with fire, now held only tears. And that awful, terrifying rictus grin, it had retreated back to whatever awful place spawned it. I do not want to hurt you. I don't want to steal from you. I want to help you. Help you to understand. Together, we could... But before Xylan could finish his thought, something slammed into him from behind. Something massive, heavy, and furry, emitting a growl that made the monk's blood run cold. It was Skog. Xylan put up his hands, pleading, Skog, no! But the cat, its massive, hammer-like paws planted on the monk's chest, only hissed in response, a grating, horrible noise that summoned up the most primal fears of Xylan's ancestors, the ones that kept them up nights before the worlds were sundered. All climbed to his feet slowly, wiping the tears from his eyes with the back of his fist. Furious that Xylan's words had affected him so, and even more angry that the monk had seen him so affected. Though his fires had been banished from Maul's skull, though Maul was no longer possessed by him, Maul did still possess his murderous intent. Maul, as if walking in his sleep, under some other power than his own, staggered a few steps forward, picking his way through the fallen pharah, stomping through the growing, coagulating puddles of blood. Then he stooped down low, and he retrieved his prize, that precious, long, twisting alabaster horn, the one that had caused so much death, so much suffering, in such a short period of time. Xylan watched in unadulterated terror as Maul, his brows lowered, his muscles relaxed, at peace with what his brain had planned for them, shuffled forward, breathing slowly, clutching the horn overhand like a dagger, a sacrificial knife inching closer and closer to the calf, bound and helpless upon that grim altar, the one with the undying thirst. The monk knew better than to struggle against the giant cat, Skog so he used the weapon that had saved him mere moments before. His voice. Maul, I see now. I know. You are... You're possessed, taken, held in thrall, and though I do not know by what... You know. We all know. He is known to everyone, whether they know it or not. Yes, 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 okay, fine. It's as you say. I know him. I know him well. But know this. I can free you. I can loosen his grip on your soul. I have no soul. Maul, at his determined, leisurely pace, reached Xylan, who cast a panicked, pleading gaze up at the savage. I can shatter his chains. I can remove his boot from your throat if you will just allow me to. 
Maul dropped himself to the ground, his knees landing dangerously close to Xylan's face, the monk's tears beginning to stream down it before falling into the dirt, where they joined with those slow-moving rivulets of gore. Maul, please, please, you have to stop. You have to think. It's never served me well. Is this all you want for yourself? Don't you want something more? Something better? Maul grimaced as he took the horn, the long, twisting alabaster horn, then raised it high above his head. The same pose he held with his cudgel, but now, instead of rage, Maul's visage held only the look of resigned duty, a bitter obligation. Please, please, Maul, is this all you want? Is this all you are? A destroyer? All your power, all of your might, all your strength, all the potential of all of the sundered worlds. And this is it. Is it? Is this really it? Is a destroyer truly all that you really are? Yes. But not for long. Before the words had stopped ringing in Xylan's ears, Maul silently struck. And as Skog looked on silently, devoid of all judgment, Maul sent the horn shooting down, a vengeful, unerring bolt from the heavens. The flash of white was the last thing Xylan saw as he clenched his eyes shut, searching for the gods he had repeatedly banished from his life. But instead of the dark, unceasing roar of the abyss, Xylan heard something else. Maul's agonized, rage-fueled scream. The monk's eyes shot open in time to see Maul pulling the horn from the ground where he had embedded it in the dirt. Xylan felt his heart slowly begin to beat once again as Skog stepped off his chest and went to join Maul, who turned his back and breathed heavily, hunched over in stomach-churning agony as he tied the horn, the object of his all-consuming desire back around his neck. Unsure if he received a pardon or just a stay of execution, Xylan climbed slowly, warily, to his feet. But suddenly, Maul turned around, eyes red as he glared at the growing light in the east. Feel the sickness you gave me, and the night will be behind us. Xylan, under the watchful gaze of Skog, laid his hands upon Maul's abdomen and once again set about removing the plague of the doomberries. But as he did so, Skog's glowing yellow eyes weren't the only thing that watched them. There was also another pair, small, keen, and as blue as the ocean, set in the sharp, tan face of a feron archer. Of the three that had been mercilessly battered and beaten by Maul, only one survived, and unobserved, he had snuck into the forest to watch and wait. The gnomes, young and old, male and female, some weeping to bemoan their fate and others stoically embracing it. They shuffled through the granite corridors, forced ahead by the points of long, regal halberds held by frowning high elf guards. They frowned because they, the youngest, most inexperienced of endless warriors, because they were placed in charge of gnomes. Gnomes. Small, foolish gnomes with their great skill and even greater knowledge. Think of what they could achieve if they were not lacking in one crucial component. Drive. They had no drive, no desire, no ambition, content to use their amazing talents for jokes and useless technology that no one asked for and labyrinthine cities built in the abandoned caves of their more ambitious cousins, the dwarves. Though the high elves and the gnomes were ostensibly allies, their relationship only went one way with the elves impressing the gnomes' finest tinkerers and inventors into their service, and in return, allowing them to continue living on the margins of a world that belonged increasingly to the elves. The high elf guards frowned, 
frustrated that they had to waste their time with these gnomes. Frustrated that the gnomes necessitated it by refusing to obey commands, by refusing to give Enlith what she desired, what she deserved, refusing to build the Deathbringers and Cataclysmatons that she demanded. Most of all, though, they were frustrated that they'd have to confront their fears, the ones that they couldn't choke down no matter how hard they tried, the fear that had been bred into their ancestors millennia ago. Enlith watched from a seat high above the room. Once used for proud, ritual, hand-to-hand combat, the elves' way of connecting with the conflict that birthed the Sundered Worlds. The room's original purpose had been abandoned, making way for this new role. Feeding Pit. The Queen of the Elves watched, emotionless, as the gnomes, at least two dozen of the tiny, ridiculous creatures, were forced into the feeding pit, the doors bolted shut behind them. Some attempted to pry them back open, or even to scale the sheer, towering 40-foot walls that surrounded the feeding pit. But the majority of them just sat, waited, and wept, their tiny arms wrapped around one another in a pitiable show of frailty. Without breaking her gaze, Enlith issued her command, choosing not to say the actual word, out of disgust for the feelings it summoned up within her. Let it eat. Reluctantly, her advisor raised his hand, a signal seen and passed down until a door at the far side of the feeding pit rose slowly with an ominous screech, and beyond that door, lumbering forward in its hideous, unnatural rhythm, a feldrun. Enlith was not alone in her viewing gallery. There were priests, advisors, nobles, and most crucially, gnome scientists, the ones who were wise enough to acquiesce to endless demands, forced to sit and to see, to learn the true cost of insubordination. But among all of them, Enlith was the only one that refused to turn her gaze away. She watched as the Feldrin shuffled forward, She watched its jaws pull apart, and she observed in abject horror as the gnomes, the ones that she had condemned, met their gruesome, terrible end, a fate worse than she had ever hoped to imagine, but a fate necessary for her revenge, the divine retribution that must come, that must occur, decency and mercy be damned. Sensing that the feeding was over, one of Enlith's bolder priests turned to behold the Feldrin's handiwork. He was ill-prepared for what he found, and he turned away quickly as the bile rose up in his throat. But Enlith's gaze remained unbroken. She would not turn, she would not shut her eyes to block out the horror that she had unleashed, and she watched, lip quivering as her warriors choked down their ancestral fears and entered the feeding pit. Wielding their ornate halberds, enchanted by the priests with some dimly understood blessing, they herded the Feldrun, heaving and groaning back into its chambers where that ancient, shrieking door lowered down behind it. And there, in its chamber, the Feldrun struggled to keep its eyes shut, weeping, the tears forcing their way out from underneath its eyelids. It tried to keep them shut, but the temptation was too great. The Feldrin's eyes shot open in that room of mirrors, and it saw itself gnarled, hateful, and awful, saw itself from all angles, heaving and weeping, howling and crying. The Feldrin gazed into its own eyes, inconsolable. And it spoke. Please, no, no, I'm so very sorry. If you're enjoying Scald, you should let everyone know by leaving a review on iTunes or Stitcher. If it's a good one, I'll read it on the show. Jay Bowles says, Give it a shot. You will be impressed and you will enjoy it. 
Aubrey is an amazing storyteller and an entertaining communicator. Very cool. Stoked to see where this goes. Reviews are awesome, but the best way to help Scald is through Patreon. It's a service that allows you to pledge a monthly dollar amount to help support the things you love, like Scald. Patreon is like Kickstarter, rewards and everything, but instead of paying someone to do something, you're paying them to keep doing it. You can pledge as little as a dollar a month, which works out to only a quarter per episode. You spend more than that on practically everything. Signing up is safe, secure, and easy. So head on over to patreon.com slash scald. Then, come find me online. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, they're all Aubrey Sitterson. A-U-B-R-E-Y-S-I-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. No spaces, no numbers. Or head over to my website, aubreysitterson.com, for links to everything, including social media, my non-scald-related projects, comics, podcasts, t-shirts, credits, bio, and contact information. Finally, where is all that Scald fan art that I know you've been working on? Send it to scaldshow at gmail.com, along with your name, city, and Twitter handle, so I can share it online with other Scald listeners. Thanks for listening. I'll talk at you next week.